Hello and welcome to this review on My Hero Academia. This time I'm reviewing the movie Your Next. Now we're going to kick off with a spoiler free review before pivot into the usual business which would be far more spoiler heavy. So we'll kick off by saying that My Hero Academia Your Next is the latest movie in the My Hero Academia series and has been long, long awaited. It originally released in Japan back in August and this week finally gets its UK release even though last week it got released in the US but hey ho we move on and I have to say that this is a damn good movie. One which I hope will be enjoyed by fans old and new to the series. It takes place during the early quarter of this year's season timeline wise and sees our heroes facing off against Dark Might, a man who really wishes that he can be All Might's successor and will stop at nothing to achieve that goal using the weird strange esoteric power that he has and the power gained from kidnapped woman that he has at his beck and call. The animation is great, the story is a lot of fun, I love the locations and how they're used and we get a great set of side villains and I think that Dark Mike as a villain is probably one of my favourite movie villains that we've had thus far for reasons that I'll discuss later on in the spoiler section certainly and it's nice to see our extended cast being used effectively and getting to actually do something in a movie this is the first movie in this entire series not to be set in mainland Japan and it does even though, to be honest, it does take place in this strange recreation of some parts of rural Italy, but still, I really enjoyed seeing it, and I think that it is well worth it for anyone who is a fan of this series. However, a word of warning, if you are seeing it, don't bother waiting for the post credit sequence. It simply is not worth it. That is probably the only major downside that I have with it, is that the post credit sequence bit is it worth waiting along for? It really, really isn't, especially not if you've been watching along with this series at home. With all that said, let us pivot into the main review. We're going to be getting into spoilers from this point out. So if you don't want this spoiled for you, switch the video off now. Thank you for watching. Leave comments on what you think about the movie down below. Yeah. Okay, now it's time to get into the main review itself and we kick off this review as we usually do with these reviews by talking about the positives. I will start off with the headline positives and say that I think that the animation is fantastic. This movie gives us some great insights into the mental states of our characters. I think the new characters that we get introduced in this movie are good and I really like the villain and the henchman. Now, I always go into a movie like this, one that's based on a TV series, which... I know it's not actually based on a TV series, it's based on a manga, but you get the idea. I always worry that when I go into a movie like this, it's just going to end up feeling like a feature length episode. And that's all it's going to end up being. Fun for what it is, but just feeling like something you could have just waited until you saw it at home. But we don't get that here. Beyond the scale of the story, the animation that we have on hand here is just brilliant. The open action sequence is a lot of fun and just exemplifies everything I love about how superpowers in this world work. It is just a classic, crazy, creative My Hero Academia action sequence, the likes of which we really haven't seen enough of over the past few years or so. It is this strange mashup of just really cool superpowers with just some really wild creativity. Like, one of the villains just merges with a truck and it becomes like My Hero Academia versus Cars. And I really like that fact of it. It's just this strange thing that I'd never in a million years expected to end up seeing with it. I just thought the guy was just going to start, you know, trying manipulating the car so they can get into it. No, he merges with it and it just becomes like a Midoriya versus Toe Mater from Cars. I know, this is right, this next thing's going to feel like a weird thing to pick up upon, particularly when I talk about animation, but I really do love the background work in this particular movie. This world that they create in this film just feels genuinely lived in and has an authentic sense of place to so much of it, particularly when we start to get into the latter half when we get into this recreated uh, Italian town. It doesn't feel like something generic, it doesn't feel like someone's just gone on to Google and typed in Italian town. It genuinely feels like a real lived in place. It feels like there is actually a logic to why everything is built here and it isn't just built there because oh I saw it on a postcard once and it kind of looked like this and even before that when we start to get the shots of the ruined city it feels like we are in this almost post-apocalyptic world with our heroes just fighting to protect people fighting over the scraps of what remains and this creates this strange feeling to so much of it and i would have liked maybe a little bit more work to 
trying to build that and contradict that with what Dark Knight was looking to do. But hey, you've got to review what's in front of you. And when we do get Dark Knight's palace thing looming over the landscape and spreading out as his power grows, as does his little fake empire, I really like that visual image. And we also have within all of that the foreshadowing of him being a fake and being a fraud and being hollow when Midoriya notes out that the trees that are in this woodland that they're in are hollow and are empty which helps foreshadow the bit later on where the the all might persona just rips off and you see the real man underneath it all and then later on when we end up getting that really nasty looking mutant version of him as he's just there in that strange demonic skin suit thing i just when that first started happening i almost yelled oh fuck because of just how startling it was to see something like that in a series like this like i'd expect this in other tv series i'd expect this in other film series but do my hero academia doing it that is just some really nasty twisted looking visuals and i'm all here for it there is this feeling though with certain animated sequences within this movie that this isn't quite the my hero academia that you know some parts of it do look different and i don't mean that in the sense of the integration of cg for certain parts of it that does feel as though there's a slight stylistic change here and there a change that i do like and it's something that i wish we'd see a little bit more of but hey that's just the weight of things and there are some really innovative little short action sequence bits like when they're fighting on the rooftop and you just get that bit where you're just following along todoroki as he's running along doing his ice stuff and that shot towards the end of the movie where you got Bakugo, Midori, and Todoroki all at the roof at the same time, just as Midori just about to shoot across the screen and seemingly kill off the villain in that rather graphic way that he boils it out to. He's just... Yeah, I really like the look of that shot. Now, one of the big issues that movies like this end up having is the fact that they're ultimately limited by the fact that they are movies. This is not an adaptation of a storyline. This is not an actual real canon part of a larger story. And if it is... Well, they're always going to be limited by the fact that they can't really go too deep on character development because if they do that, then it's going to make things feel a little bit weird for the people that don't watch the movies or haven't seen this movie yet. But in this movie, they seemingly find a way around that by just giving us these really great insights into these characters and where they are in their life. Nothing really changes about them, but we get to see a side of them that we haven't seen in the main series. This villain that we have, one of the villains that works for the bad guy, the one that looks like the, the, the tall vampire lady from the most recent uh, Resident Evil video game. She has this power where she can make people see the most desired thing in the world. And when it starts out, it starts out for gags with uh, Denki and uh, with the little perv goblin guy just uh, seeing, oh, four boobs, oh, look at all these fit ladies, four. And you think, oh, okay, silly, fun, wacky, whatever. And then Shoto's vision comes in. And when I see that, and I'm just starting to see it take place and starting to feel it form, in my mind, it's like that meme with John Bernthal going, no, 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 anything but this, no, 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 no. And that's just the feel I had deep down. Because I just, as it was happening, I was just feeling, no, don't do this now. You're not doing this now. You're not doing this now in a funny, silly, happy, fun movie. Oh, no, you're not doing this now. Because the one thing that Shoto just wants deep down is to have a happy, stable family life. His whole family, even Dabby. And when it came clear to me that that's what he wanted most in the world, oh my god, that winded me. I was not expecting something like that to just suddenly come up in this movie. And then, of course, you then pivot into another funny one with Yaya Rosu just having a nice cup of tea and a sit down. Oh, isn't this fun? Isn't this great? And then we get the one with Tenya, and you think, oh, what's going to happen with Tenya? Oh, it's going to be something silly and fun, like, oh, he's doing it, having a day with just doing all his homework, or everyone's respecting his authority at school, but no, it's, it's him being a hero alongside his big brother who was horribly paralyzed by that villain that a section of the fan base really really likes and it kind of breaks your heart when you realize oh they're never gonna get to do that and then he, then it switches again to, to froppy and oh it's her spending time with her family and it's cute and it's fun and yeah there's a little bit of bit of sweetness there because you know there's the uh, the halloween episode where we get a little bit of an insight into her home life and she doesn't get time to spend with her family which is okay bit of sweet but oh, you know it's fun and cute and then then we get the one we showed you and here's one big thing that he wants in the world is just to be accepted for what he is and not get beaten up by the people that he lives in the village with because he's a heteromorph and just 
wants to not be seen as a monster. And just when all this, 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 all these things are happening, it just br adds this real bitter sweetness to this scene that otherwise could have just been a bunch of characters just doing stuff for want of a better phrase, just a bunch of fun or side gags. It ends up setting off for some really powerful moments in this movie that come really early on. And I wish that we'd saw seen more of this stuff in this movie because we do get hints of and background shots later on in the movie where Midori is walking through the recreation of the alleyway where um, All Might first suggested that he would be his successor. And when you see that cutaway, like it's the side of a doll's house of all the other classmates, and you get hints of what they want here and there, and, and maybe that would make for a cool video at a later point to just go through what each of these characters really want. But for what we end up getting with these, like I say, it's just shockingly effective and has this bitter sweetness that I wasn't expecting at all because like I say with movies like this we don't get these deeper dives into these characters and what they think and how they feel and no sense of character development because you practically can't do that and whilst Midoriya's is played for laughs you can also argue that it really isn't because we see in his little world it's him being a child again just going gaga for all this All Might related memorabilia and merchandise and oh All Might's here and come on little hero we're gonna save the day and it gives you this sense that deep down he has this longing to not be a hero anymore that he longs for this simpler time when he was just a fan of All Might and that was it and particularly when you bear in mind where he's gone over the past year or two in his life in canon it's really answer and again adding for this bitter sweetness to it and i really wish there was just something we got more of in the main series i really wish we got this deeper insight into just where midoriya really is mentally like we do get a little hint of that with the dark deku stuff but aside from that it's not something we really get much of a look into but this whole sequence of events this whole villain power is just this fantastic mechanism to get this deep dive into these characters and to give us a moment for character development that we don't otherwise end up seeing. Now, I do like the new characters that we do get in this movie. I think Gandini is an interesting character, but I do wish that he was a little less enigmatic and we got a better insight as to who he really is. Like, I mean, this is a guy that effectively turned himself into a cyborg to save a Servino. Like, that's a level of commitment to her, which, yeah, you know that he deep down he loves her and... Yeah, even the, the thing is that when we see him in that flashback when uh, Dark Might's men attack the place, yeah, he got knocked about, but not knocked about to this extent that he needed a new cybernetic eye. Like, he's turned himself into a cyborg to try and save the day here, which makes sense given what uh, what Anna's power is, but still, it's something I wish we got a bit of an insight into. Like, we get an insight as to who they are on as a personality, as a character. There's something that's very methodical, and this is something that's shown by how much time they spend making tea. Like, there he is introduced into this series where he's just there in the middle of this blown-out wasteland just making a cup of tea like it's nothing at all, and... I, whilst I think they're interesting, I will say is that the character that we got Midoriya knocking about within the last movie felt more endearing, and that Gandini's big problem is he ultimately feels rather closed off to Midoriya, and to the rest of the cast to the point that he feels like he's having his own separate movie. Savino has a powerful quirk, but I think that she feels too much like a damsel in distress. He doesn't do much of anything, and it would have again been nice to get into an insight into her, into who she really is, and to how she really wishes her life could be because her quirk just sounds really horrible on her end for everyone else it's a means to an end it's giving her power but for her she it gives her powerful seizures and makes her life a misery and it's only going to get worse as she gets older or it would do until she loses a quirk at the end of the movie and just getting an insight as to how a character how a person would deal with that is something i wish that they went up going into with all that said however we got to talk about the big villain and we got to talk about Dark Might and his team. I just find them to be really fascinating. In the previews leading up to this movie, I just thought that Dark Might was just going to be some, just some psycho, just some nutcase who took All Might's message the wrong way. But no, this guy's a mafia don. That was not what I was expecting here. I was not expecting the twist here to be that this guy is a mafioso. Now, I know it isn't really a twist, but the fact that that's who he is, who he really is, is just wild. 
Valdo Golin is a flamboyant, self-important, bitter little psychopath, and he's what happens when you answer that Machiavellian question of, is it better to be loved or feared with feared, please? He is unlike any of the other past movie villains. He isn't just some guy who got in over their head. He isn't a test subject, a pawn in a larger scheme. He isn't this zealot that's been manipulated by possibly faulty material. He's just a crook. Just some mafioso who wants to turn Japan into the throne of his own criminal empire and then in time use that as a launch pad to take over the world. They are just so brilliantly self-important and self-serving. They don't have a dogma. Their dogma is just to be a villain and to be the best thing since sliced bread and just do it because... Well, why not? Because I'm... Uh, this is... Uh, I'm brilliant. I'm brilliant and amazing, so I might as well be the most brilliant and amazing thing around. They're animated in a way that is just so expressive. From their facial expressions to their body language and how they carry themselves in a scene, they are in love with what themselves and what they think they represent. They want to play at being a supervillain and being a mafia don at the same time, and these two things aren't really all that compatible as we see as all this goes through it. He's constantly going from dressing like a mafioso to dressing like a superhero or a supervillain, and flicking between these two like seemingly every other scene as he tries to figure out exactly what the hell he's supposed to be, and he's he's got his he's underlings, these other gangsters that are with him are just gangsters with superpowers that's all they are with only one of them really leaning into the supervillain bit and they're off almost as soon as they appear in a way which feels like something out of a bond movie or the simpsons if you want to go that way as well where he just opens up a floor, hole in the floor and they fall through it to god knows only where to seemingly die off they are just so enjoyably evil like almost maybe a tad too cartoonish for some but I just think that we were bloody amazing. Just every scene that they are on, they're stealing the show. They, I wish that we just got more of them just being wickedly evil. Like, I will admit that I watched this dub and I think that Sabat did a fine job as Golini. Like, I, I, I do wish that would have been a little bit more there, as I ultimately always do when I'm watching this dubbed. Like, I have nothing against the English language voice actors, but there's always this feeling of there's something more that they could be giving and i just wish that they would and i think it may be that they're just not being directed well enough and that sam does well in the role and there is enough of a distinction between dark might and all might there are moments where it feels like dark might is someone trying to do an all might impression which works for me i mean the guy's supposed to be an italian mobster and the, the to be I'm thankful he's not got some kind of cartoonish italian accent but still i think there needed to be a little bit something there but still it's good for what it is with that said however let us quickly get into the navigators and i think that my one of my big problems that i have with it with the movie as a whole ends is that i think that gandini needed more development like i say they are good for what they are but to borrow a quirk from the movie, they're just the cool side character. It doesn't really feel as though they contribute much to anything rather than being a vehicle for exposition and being the one that in unintentionally saves the day in the end. I think that they really needed more character development. Again, the character, the, the, the cool side character that we got in the last movie worked better because we got a better sense as to who they are as a person and why they are the way that they are and the lengths they're willing to go to to save their family and to save the day. This one we do get that, but they're just such a cold customer that it's kind of hard to get really endeared to them. And I think that maybe if we got an idea as to who they really were and why they, how they came to end up being the service of, of Anna's family, I think that would be interesting. I mean maybe he they used to be a gangster and they wanted to do this to get out of that life and they were that's why they were perfectly fine with effectively just being hurt be, being kept onto the, the manor for all that time i don't know but again i think that more need to be done with them and i will say is that the like i said earlier on in the in the spoiler free section the post credit scene is utterly 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 worthless it's well animated but there's no value there Seeing as we are in the spoiler section, I'll just spoil it here and now. The movie, the post credit sequence is just, it's all for one and Toma in the cave just like a day or so before the final 
confrontation began and that's it that's really all it is like the animation and the composition on the shot is cool and stuff but it adds nothing nothing that we haven't seen before i'm bearing in mind that this took this episode the actual episode that they did this in the in the anime happened months ago at this point i don't understand why it's there like it's fine if you want to use it as a mechanism to figure out where this movie fits in with the timeline but outside of that i really don't get the point in doing it he adds nothing and he just makes me think that maybe there was something behind the scenes that changed when this movie was supposed to come out like maybe this was supposed to come out earlier in the year and as such that oh no he's waking up about to do some evil would have worked better but even still there's we get shots of stuff that happened early on in this year's season so it would have been spoiler so i don't know the timing of this I don't understand the point of the post credit sequence, and if I talk about it too long, I'm just going to start going over the same ground over and over again. So let's pivot into the overview and say that, yeah, as I said earlier on, this is a great movie. I really did enjoy it, and I am happy that I went out to see it. I There's moments in it which just took my breath away, especially when we got those deeper insights into the mental state of our characters and what they really long for in this world. It's the kind of thing I wish we'd see in the main series, because... That is just a brilliant way of just solving the problem of we can't develop the characters in the movie, so we need to have something in it, and this is a brilliant way in doing it. With that said, let me know what you thought about it in the comment section down below. There's not going to be a comment corner on this one, because quite frankly, yeah, quite frankly, there's little point doing so, because any comments I would be reading out would be for the most recent series and i don't want to spoil anything for anyone who might be seeing these almost in chronological order so just let me know what you thought about it down below and i might get back to you at a later point i will get back to you in the comment section where or not there'll be a video dedicated to reading the comments on this it depends on how many I end up getting but thank you for all for listening thank you all for watching and see you next time goodbye thanks for watching be sure to like favorite subscribe click the bell and do all the youtubey stuff that youtube wants you to do go on it'll do me a power of good until next time my friends Goodbye!